All right, here we are. Well, so um, Christian, welcome. Thank you. It's great to see you. Um, my first question, and I found myself asking this question a lot lately, um, which is you know, just around where Web3 names come from. And yours is no creative, yeah. sometimes no creative abode. Yeah. Um, where did that come from and why did you drop the abode? And did you drop the abode? I did drop the abode. I can't drop it on Instagram because you can't just change your name there like you can on Twitter. Um, it, it came about when I kind of transitioned into 3D. Uh, I used to be, well, I started off as a photographer. Then I became a, a high-end researcher and worked as a, as a researcher for 13 years and then slowly started to transition into 3D. Um, when transitioning into 3D, I created a new Instagram account and I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. And I don't know what my created goal or home was. So I came up with the name No Creative Home. That was taken. So I had to find a synonym for home and I used a boat. Um, then Web3 came around and uh, I kind of I kind of found my home. So I ditched the no home and it became no creative instead. So that's the bully of why I'm no creative now. What prompted the move um, from photography to 3D or I guess otherwise stated like into 3D, maybe not. Well, um, it's really has always been like a passion and an interest of mine. Like I remember as a kid watching like shows about people using 3D and effects and so on. Um, but I was never really able to get the results without being Pixar and having an actual render farm and understanding the render engines and so on. Um, it was kind of the same transition, tr transition as me going from photography into retouching because I'm probably a more technical person when it comes to like, I love taking photos, but like the competition was very high. And what I saw was that I was pretty, pretty damn good at the retouching and the competition in retouching was not as high as it was with photographers and people were starting to ask me like hey can you help me edit my photo and i started making money that way um so transitioning from photography to retouching kind of happened that way and the same with 3d like i started dabbling around around 3d because my friend told me about and that's back to the render engine my friend was like hey um check out this render engine we can actually achieve what we want now on a basic computer setup i was like holy shit this is like a photo studio only i can control the sun um and create a mountain if i want uh, start dabbling in that and then um actually a competing studio retouching uh, studio called me i was like dude we've seen what you're doing with your Instagram account. Like he was a friend from back, back from school and asked me if I could do like bend a bottle cap into the shape of a heart. Cause that would be a lot easier to do in 3d. They thought, um, than doing like doing it for real and then taking a picture of it or like compositing it in Photoshop. And I just did that. And then they were like, okay, how long did that take? So it's like, oh, it was like, oh, okay, interesting. And then they came coming back with new jobs. Um, and at some point, they just asked me to start like a, a department at the, their studio. So I'm still working there um, full time. I'm doing NFTs on the side, but that's that's how it happened. I'm curious to know how being a color grader uh, trained your attention. Oh, yeah. Are there any meta skills that you can look back on as, as having developed as a result of this, this practice? Cause I mean, just looking at your 3d work, the colors themselves are very cinematic. There's like a, there's a Kodachrome kind of yeah. vibe yeah. to it. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how, how your attention shifts 
when you are a color grader? Well, it's kind of like, it's so ingrained into how I do everything now. Cause like, that's what I did with retouching. Like, um, we, we are Nordic retouching studio. So we didn't do like the over beautifying of women and so on. We often said stop to the client, like no more, like this is not okay. They are not human anymore and so on. What we really focused on was getting that often that filmic look like the old Kodak look and so on. Cause as we move further, further away from analog, I know some are moving back, right? But a lot of photographers tend to just get like a really high end digital camera and everything is too perfect. Like it's way too perfect. So what we often would do was like get old film cameras and take pictures of walls. So we could use the original gray that was in, in the film um, medium. And that's the same techniques I like, I don't even think about it, but I apply to my um, to my 3D images because what we what we m most of the time had to do in uh, 3D was um, develop a feel, right? This needs to be a summer campaign. It needs to be warm, it needs to be light and welcoming right and and a lot of my my especially the stills revolves around a feeling um and it's the same same technique i apply with the colors like colors are a great medium to express feelings with yeah, yeah. you also write short little poems to accompany each piece can you tell me about this practice? Do do the poems exist separately, and you you kind of make match make, or are does it come after? They come during the piece because they are like they like the colors. They emphasize what I want to express with these pieces, um, and they they often like my work takes so long to create. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, we're talking like several weeks often where I keep working on something, going back and forth from that and like just trying to hit on that, well, that expression and feeling I'm going for. So like while I'm doing, what do you call it? Like monotone, like easy tasks on the work, like painting a wall or just modeling something one day like a balustrade or something i i think about the poems automatically and they come into existence in existence that way and i have like a google doc sitting next to it and i'll like type stuff down, like ideas and where we're going with this can you tell me about your interest in architecture it's a prominent feature in your work you've you've gone kind of all over the world yeah. in your pieces J yeah. japan um europe uh the middle east yeah yeah um so when i was a kid like me and my dad would often well when we went on vacation um my dad would always go to like a church or something like that and walk in there and not that we were religious or anything like that of course being danish you're culturally christian but it was not something we practiced like we didn't go to church or anything but like he had a very particular interest in these grand buildings um and like churches and mosques and minarets and so on as something that like really interests me somehow like religious buildings because walking into one gives you a feeling of awe and it's just, just a different experience. It's the same with grand museums, right? Um, and my, my dad's aunt lived in Copenhagen. Like, I'm born on a farm. Um, well, not on the farm. I was born in a hospital. I lived on the farm. That's okay. Um, but I would go to Copenhagen where she lived, and she was like the cultural person in my family. And she would drag me along to museums too, and I would have the same experience walking into these grand halls and the painting hanging on the walls and all that. So 
it it stems all the way back to me as a kid and again the feeling i had and the feeling i still have like i do what my dad did i walk into churches whenever i have the chance and like i love going to museums every time i'm like abroad i'll go to a museum last time it was the met in uh, in new york and i was very inspired and you might see a piece that's inspired by the met at some point <laughs> Thing with the Louvre in uh, Paris. Yeah, the Met is definitely awe inspiring. Yeah, and um, have great memories of the Met walking in, and you know, you're in there for maybe about three hours, and you're like, okay, this is enough museum for me to deal with for today. I'm about full up, but then it takes you another hour and a half to to find your way exactly. out of the actual building. Yeah, I got lost several times. Um, so I was reading a, a, um, an interview you did with NFT culture mm -hmm. and you described yourself this way. You said, I make 3d based art with an emphasis on an exploration of architecture, art history, and the radical movement of fabric suspended in weightlessness. Um, there was another inter interview where you referred to yourself as tapestry boy. Um, <laughs> can you, can you tell me about your fascination with what, uh, what has become your signature this uh these um you know bolts of fabric floating in air and and other pieces of clothing occasionally yeah so that, that's actually a thing that goes all the way back to me being a photography student um i would go to like abandoned places because like when you're a photography student all you want to do is take pictures right be it of people buildings landscapes or whatever what you're interested in. and the same as back then i was kind of like fascinated by empty spaces and magic realism so what I would do was I would bring a friend to like often abandoned places like old factories in Copenhagen or like parking lots and stuff like that. And I would have bought a bed sheet and have my friend toss it in the air and we would spend like sometimes we would have, have lighting set up. Sometimes we would just use like the sun um, and he, he or she would toss it in the air. And I would take a picture and we would do that over and over and over until I couldn't force my friends to, to, to do it anymore. Same with waves, like waves has a club feeling too. I'm like very fascinated. Of... I had a girlfriend at one point that was actually Iceland, as we discussed before the interview. Um, and she had to drag me away from the coast because I, I just couldn't let it go. Like I took pictures of five. 600 pictures of waves that day um and when i transitioned into 3d like one of the programs that really fascinated me was uh, houdini um and at one point i figured out that in houdini you can create a wind system um like literally how the wind will affect something and that's how i create my cloth pieces that is tossing a sheet into this wind system. And so I, I never really know what happens unless like I need to do something really controlled, like something go in a circle or like the um, synthetic where the jellyfish things goes in kind of a figure eight, but still something strange, something unpredicted will always happen with it. Um, like, the gel I spent so long, so 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 long time on. It's actually not a great jellyfish, but the sea slug. Um, it fell apart and it did things, and it actually in this piece it almost falls apart at the end. Uh, but then I mean it comes together again and it looks behind the glass. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that covers it, but like I'm just fascinated by the way fabric moves. <laughs> <laughs> in space um and now i'm simulating it all the time in 3d it seems that you know looking across your body of work obviously the the cloth pieces kind of have a this very dominant dominating effect to your 
to your body of work because it is such a, a singular uh, vision. But looking kind of more broadly, I see, and maybe you can speak to this, texture as really your subject matter yeah. um, rather than any kind of necessarily like narrative or characters. You know, looking at your overgrown building pieces like the Gardener or the Feather series with pieces like Canary. Mm. Um, can you maybe speak to to this um, to this obsession? And and maybe are there other artists who who whose similar obsession with texture um, speak to you? Well, it like like the cloth. And now when you were talking, I, I realized that like when I was researched that I worked a lot with fashion, right? And a lot with clothing and getting getting the right feel of dresses was a huge part. Like when you're doing researching for a company like like high high end clothes branding, um you need to make sure that the texture is perfect and the colors are perfect. Because that's all the designers cares, cares about. It's, it's the babies, the, the literal child, children. children. Um, so it definitely comes back to that. But the textual concept of my work is probably like, what's his name? I can't remember his name, but but there's a lot of 3D artists who really gets into the idea of simulating the real world to the point where you can't see the difference between like now we have AI and AI is really good at this, um, but before that like 3D artists would really 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 try to simulate the world, right? I do this. But then I add like elements that makes it unreal, like like canary. Um, I kind of I kind of have the idea of making a rock out of bird bird feathers, but they kind of became hair instead. Um, and that was the whole idea and concept of creating something that that would look real, but absolutely wasn't. Um, and that, that's it's the same process with my uh, with the cloth pieces that like I will create this room I will make it absolutely right like I will make try and make it look as real as possible then I will toss some cloth into it and freeze it in place or have it floating around and then I'll add the grading the color grading to it and really screw with the colors to like emphasize that this is not real. This is magical. This is something completely different. You mentioned magical realism, and um, I, I, I did sort of have a question in the back of my mind around uh, cinema in particular and, and its influence on your work. You're from Scandinavia, has a, an incredibly rich cinematic history. Yeah. You're also you've you've studied Japanese, and, <laughs> and uh, some of your some of your work uh, hinges on some Japanese inspiration. And one of your, you know, one of your big photo photographic uh, inspirations is Hiroshi Sugimoto. So I guess I'm uh, all that to say, is there. Um, what, do do you have any specific influences with regard to cinema? Well, obviously, I, I love I love cinema and I love movies that does something different, right? Like I don't get me wrong, like I will watch John Wick over and over and over. Um, but like I I recently saw Tar too and absolutely love that movie and like um, what's it called? Something called. It was um, Dark Will by um, the Danish uh, director. What's his name? Now? I'm so bad with names. Anyway, like the cinema influences has always influenced me. Um, and like in books, I find an inspiration there for like things I do or things I want to experiment with. And yeah, so and and I've never been a person who like needs it to be either in Danish or English, obviously, since I'm like my main, main girl. 
um, I've watched French films, Korean films, like Thai films. I've been all over the world, and like there's incredible cinema out there. And well, it's the same with music and books. Something that surprises me and does things differently, um, be it color grading, storytelling, the way you use the camera, or the way you describe the narrative of a book. Um, interests me and inspires me and that's probably also why like my artworks are a bit different than most people um nature is object speaking of hiroshi sugimoto nature is object strikes me as a series that in particular was perhaps inspired by his dioramas uh -huh. um it's also quite the breakaway from your usual work um can you can you tell me about where this this series came from and what you're what you're trying to do with it it is a breakaway but well let's let's start from the beginning this is the first mint ever um the first oh mint. it is it is it's the first mint on mega's place a couple of days after i was accepted there i minted um the series um nature as an object and the whole idea behind it is that the way humans look at nature is by mainly objectifying it, right? We have these specific species we care about, like lions, giraffes, pandas, and so on. And at the same time, like thousands of species are going extinct um, every day, and we do not bat an eye. We care about monsteros um, and beautiful house plants, and it's it's the same thing. Well, what was going on in my mind while creating nature as an object um, was that you would have to go to a museum to see an actual plant. <laughs> um, and it's the same with th synthetic. If you read the full, I have like a one page description of synthetic is that the idea was that at some point, if we co keep going like we're going now, you won't be able to see these dancing sea slugs because the, the oceans will not be suitable for these kinds of, um, of beings anymore. Like they are fragile, they live in specific parts of coral reefs and so on. So the only way you would have to see them um, would be on video or as something synthetic, something where we emulate their dance. Um, a lot of my works takes some kind of like, it springs from a lot of those. Like I often have trees encroaching into my grand environments like they were abandoned by humans and nature is coming back um i'm not completely sure how i'm supposed to finish this but like n nature and the relationship between human and nature is, is something i really care about and something that interests me and i hope to invoke some kind of fun well, feeling in the people who watches my work and makes, especially if you read some of the descriptions, like think about what we're doing to this planet. I'm going to turn on some light, just say. Sure. There we go. <clears throat> um, what's it? Um, sorry, I'm like finding my 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 place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we talked about some of your visual influences and I'm curious to know in your animated pieces, if you have any, any influences or touch points with regard to sound design. Um, do you do your sound design yourself Absolutely. and, um, yeah. and, and kind of what are you trying to achieve there? Um, a feeling <laughs> as always take, uh, take, um, in route. The one I did for uh, Neil for um, for the curation and the Beijing Contemporary Exhibition. That one, um, I wanted to emulate the nature of a place I used to go as a kid. It's like this vast land in Denmark. It's hard to describe, and I don't know what the English word is for it, but it's very barren, uh, almost like a desert, but 
with this really particular fla flora. Um, so, so what I did when I had finished the piece, again, we have lines of mirrors, like encapsulating the nature, and like nature has been boxed in by humans again. So the, there's the, the nature relationship again. I'm like, we need to go certain places to see wild nature at some point in the future. Well, that's how I see it anyway. Anyways, um, the sound design for that one um, is a classical piece of music. I have slowed down by, I think, 7,000%. But that's what's going on in the background. Um, it's Vivaldi is the Four Seasons, or it's Swan Lake. I confuse those two often. But anyways, and then I went to the actual place and recorded the sound of the leaves rustling and the birds chirping and, and all that, and um, well, added it to uh, to the sound the soundscape of uh, the piece. Same, same, That's cool. Yeah, same with synthetic and. Um, same with um, the Kubrick, the swirling cloth piece where you go into it, it expands out again. Um, I, I like slowing down classical music because it gives such an eerie feel to it. And it becomes somehow it's recognizable in some way. And I really go for, for places in the music where you will catch that maybe this is something you've heard before but yeah sure like the the uneasiness and then i'll add like a lot of other layers like textures again so yeah when is a piece an animated piece and when is it a still piece i mean obviously the animated piece is animated but from a from a creative process standpoint it's really hard. What kind of an impact do I want to to make? Um, sometimes, like, obviously, animated pieces often have an easier impact on people. Like, oh, it moves and it catches your attention. Um, I tend to go less detailed with animated pieces because it's a lot of work, to be honest. Um, Animate, animate. If I have to be frank, I hate animating. <laughs> I, I, I love it, but I hate it because I'm a perfectionist. It's so much easier to correct mistakes in, um, in a still image than it is in, uh, in an animation. You would not believe the amount of time it took to in, make in route a perfect loop. Like within Root, I tried to do something I had not seen anyone do before and have the radical movement of cloth being a perfect loop. I think I retouched manually 250 frames to cover up the mistakes in the looping of the cloth. It was hell. <laughs> and I, I did it three times because I wasn't satisfied with the result. So um, I guess when I really want to be in pain, it's going to be an animation. This brings up, we, we've talked a little bit about when we were in F, at NFT NYC about AI and, you know, just today um, we, you, you, uh, the Bloom Collective has settled on, on a curation set for yeah. an AI exhibit that um, Makerspace is hosting. Can you tell me about um your use of ai yeah absolutely um, i i imagine that it speeds things up quite a bit it really does like i'm completely i used to i, I used to use inter, uh, interest pinterest a lot um i've kind of abandoned pinterest lately and just prompts my way to the sketch of the piece i want i have um I have one coming out in Megas Place in, in a few days, um, and that was completely like the idea was in my head, and then I just started prompting it, and the whole piece is kind of built around three or four prompts um, from Mid Journey. So that 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 and that just came completely natural. Like I just 
I first went to Google and was like Googling what I wanted, but then I was like, well, I'm not, why ship wouldn't I just try and do this in uh, mid journey and mid journey just gave me kind of what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, and for text journey, like before you would go to uh, a stuck site or free stock site, or uh, cause you don't want issues with stock images. <laughs> We've seen that throughout um, the web tree space that uh, people get in a lot of trouble. And, uh, they don't check uh, how they can use these, but AI, you, you do not have that problem. Um, a piece like estranged based on a church in Denmark, I wanted to have a fresco in the ceiling um, and a lot of times in Danish churches, you will paint the sky circular in, in these domes and have the sun shining. Well, not the, the literal sun, but the painted sun too. So that's what I described this time in Dali, because this was earlier on. I mainly use mid you now. I uh, just said like circular sky, like a fresco, church-inspired architecture and so on. And it just gave it to me and I converted it into a texture and there we are. I had a um, well, a fresco for my piece that was completely custom made and not something I had to worry about, like rights. So I didn't have to, I didn't have to buy it. I could just use my subscription and like texturing with AI is pretty amazing. Um, and I'm kind of doing it a lot now. So, so that's really how it's integrated into my workflow. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the the Bloom Collective? Yeah. Um, how did it come about? How does it function? How did it come about? Um, we all entered Web3 back in either late 2020 or start 2021 and met each other through Twitter, where we would take notice of each other on shield threads i remember like me doing a show me your art thread because like back then you're just throwing everything at the wall seeing what stuck like i didn't have any followers on twitter and i didn't know what to do on twitter i had 24 followers on twitter when i started um and shawan posted a piece the one with the fish swimming over her face like the moving makeup i was like this is the best shit i've seen in such a long time it was, it was ghost in the shell combined with fashion and i was like oh shit this is so cool and we started talking and i was like oh, but twitter's hard to communicate on because people disappear again and then they don't see you know this and then i created a, a discord channel called home Funnily enough, um, the home of artists. And everybody kind of came in there, like Stefan, Ben Thomas, Icky came in there, Jawan was there from the start. And like this, it's still around. And there's a couple of guys from Megan's Place too. Um, it's a lot quieter now because like everybody's doing a lot of things. Um, but then at some point, like, the collective idea sprang from that, but I didn't like, we didn't create the collective collective until a year later. Cause I felt, well, my idea of creating it was that I really wanted to make sure that these was people, people who were serious about this, that they were not going to leave. Like they were people I could trust the professional people people who knew how to network, people who knew to, how to push the space forward and people who like-mindedly wanted to bridge the gap and saw this as a genuine opportunity to become an artist in a different way, understanding the technology and all that. And after a year, I think Iki came to me and was like, dude, I have this idea of making a small group. And I was like, dude, I've been thinking about this for a year. And we spent two weeks talking about who we should add to it, ask them and add them. And then we hit the ground running. Um, Bloom uh, c consists of these like souls of fire that really wants to 
pushed himself and each other and other people forward. So what Bloom actually is, is a manage, uh, opportunity management group. We do a, a meeting once a week where we talk about what, what are we doing? Are we doing the Maker's Place thing? We're doing the career curation. Who's going to Lisbon? What are you doing there, Siobhan? Because Siobhan obviously has NFT Asia too and has a lot on her hands with that. And she's fucking successful too. So <laughs> she's a busy one and the same. And we added Jenny recently too, who's like also just working so hard on everything. So that that's what it is. But like, if Jenny has an opportunity, she where like, do you need any other artists? Or do you want to do like a curation? And she'll be like, oh, I, I can't like, I can't do a curation. She will come in to, to the Bloom Discord and be like, I have this opportunity. Anyone want to help me with? And the same with me, right? Like, we talked about it in in New York of doing the AI curation, and I went to Bloom. I was like, they want to do a curation. Everybody was clapping, yay, let's do it. And everybody's been supportive, been helping with it. Like, when I told them we need to pick up the artworks um, by, well, that's today for us. Um, they just made a Google sheet and talked about everything. I was like, oh, I really love how this person went into detail with the description or what. And yeah, that's that's how it works. <laughs> it's it's um it's definitely um a way to push each other each other forward, but also like just help each other. Because like being an artist in the Web three space, being your own promoter, your own like you need to do the art, you need to promote, you need to network, you need to talk to collectors, you need to manage your your money, <laughs> you need to travel, and, and all of these, and you need to remember all these things at the same time. Right? Um, it just helps being more than one person. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned Twitter and and you know finding finding like minded artists who are also good at at marketing and networking. You said you started with twenty four followers. This comes up a lot when talking to artists. Um, with with for me is is this necessity for marketing oneself for networking. And it, it, there is a kind of, I think in some artists' minds, there's a bit of a dirty word feeling to marketing or, or networking. Can you maybe talk a little bit about how you went from 24 followers uh, to not, not like X number of followers, but feeling like you had a supportive network and that, and that you had kind of found a, a home online? Um, first off, the idea of branding and marketing in the artist world being a dirty word is a romantic lie. I do not believe it. The reason why canvases are made out of cloth was to make get them easier to transport for artists so they could go out and market themselves. Before that, they painted on wood, right? Um, marketing and art that's always been a commercial thing so let's just bury that one right now um growing a community on twitter is hard and it takes a lot of time and what you really need to understand is how to manage yourself and reply to people and be consistent in what you're doing I think the most important thing you can do on Twitter is add value to other people and help other people without expecting anything in return. Um, that really has helped me grow my base of followers and supportive people and, and all that and like try to give a, give as much to the community as you can and really do not expect anything in return. And then be consistent. Like the algorithm, you need to understand the algorithm. Like it doesn't care about you, but it cares about consistency. Um, so I think that's, that's the bullion of it. Um, 
and be be ready to change what you're doing at any time because at some point like another maniac comes in and buys twitter and everything changes again <laughs> Yeah, I gotta stay on your toes these days. Yeah, you really do. Um, I want to take a step back and ask about your piece, which is probably my favorite piece of yours. And I think, according to an NFT culture interview that I talked about earlier, it's also your favorite piece, uh, Developé. Um, I don't want to insert myself too much into this interview, but... Um, seeing Edgar Degas work at the New Orleans Museum of Art when I was maybe 10 or 12 was probably the first experience for me of of this kind of kind of like a life-changing experience with art and and I was also lucky enough to I mean circumstantially it was only that show was only 10 blocks away from Degas' house. So a couple of years later, I got to go and actually see where he lived and where he painted a lot of his work. This, you know, I when I saw it, I thought Degas and then read up on it. Yes, in fact, it was inspired by Degas. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the the genesis of this piece and and why it is, or at least at one point was, your favorite piece? Yeah, it's it's definitely one I'm really proud of. I love them all. Need to remember that. <laughs> um, but uh, it's the it's the, it's it's the merging of fashion, right? Like before before fashion, we had the guy. Um, obviously, there's always been fashion, but he was like a strange man in many ways. Um, the way he would depict these ballet dancers and his fascination with it and the way he also like would paint the same scene over and over and over again and like all his small little like i love hiding little things in my pieces if if you go over a lot of my work you'll find cables the sole reason why I put cables into my pictures are because I was a researcher and half of the time I was removing cables. So now I'm being a rebel and sticking them back in. Um, and there will be little messages and like stuff. And the, the God did the same. This is this a famous piece where there's a watering can down in the corner. And the reason why there's a water can is because they didn't want the girls to kick up dust in the ballet studio. But the girl is then like having the exact same pose and the image as the watering can. And that's just the girls taking the piss. Like he just did that for a laugh. Um, and I love that. I, and I honestly, I love the girls and I wanted to see well, the whole whole idea of creating this piece was to create something the gas ask ballet dancers, but without the girls, because ballet is such a strange art form. Uh, because everything except for the dance is interchangeable. Like the 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 ballet master will be interchangeable. We'll take the Swan Lake, for example, something that, again, I keep uh, mentioning because it fascinates me. Like, it doesn't have to be the same person. Like, any ballet studio can perform the, the Swan Lake and they can do iterations of it, but it will always be the, the Swan Lake. And it can be different ballet masters, right? So the tutus floating around without the girls was my interpretation of what a ballet is. Like the essence of a ballet is the dance. The person does not matter. Love that. Um, I want to ask a few questions that kind of like the question about marketing and Twitter might be more broadly applicable for our audience of, of artists who are hoping to make a better living or, or maybe, you know, go full time on, on their art. Um, can you share any specific rituals or practices that help you maintain creative momentum? 
Um, in marketing or in like? No, just kind of in your in your art. Books, movies, other artists, um, Twitter. Like, go on Twitter and look it up. <laughs> There's so much out of it. Like, it's wonderful, isn't it? You are exposed to so many incredible artists every day there. Um, but, like, the thing with, again, that's going back to the fact that it takes me so long to create anything that I would, would think a lot about, like, what I'm doing and new it's ideas just comes automatically. Like I have twenty pieces in my head ready to go. Um I just need to find the time to create them. <laughs> um so I, I don't know, I don't know. And also like it's another thing is that I over the last fifteen years I've been trained to be creative on command. Right? I have to go into work. There would be a photographer. There would probably be a creative studio, like a commercial studio, and there would be a designer, and there would be my colleagues and my boss. So you having a bad day as a researcher is not an option. You need to execute. You need to make this beautiful. You need to materialize the ideas and... Um, the concept of what this this retouching job had to be like it was not old fashioned like sometimes I had to do like more creative compositing right and have freer hands now I have very free hands working with 3D like a lot of people would come to me with a vague description of what they want and just expect me to do whatever it is so. It's experience, to be honest. It's keep doing what you're doing. Don't give up and like push it. And if you hit that ball of um, what do you call it when a creative can't create, like the creative block, mm -hmm. like probably just accept it and go do something else until uh, like an idea comes up. Um, you have the freedom in art to have a creative block. You do not when you have to work every day from nine to five. What about on the on the flip side? You mentioned you have 20 ideas at least floating in your head to do later. If a piece takes you, you know, two, three, four weeks, um, how how do you then focus on on an idea and block everything else out? Is that a conscious uh, choice that you make is that uh, do you do you struggle with the intrusion of too many ideas? No. Um, when I sit down and start working, everything disappears. Like it's meditation. Um, and I know a lot of artists who will work like on a lot of different pieces at a time. And one of my very good friends, he's always got like nine going. I have one usually. <laughs> this month has been a bit bit different because there's been a lot going on but like they keep like I've, I'm working on one right now in Lisbon it just doesn't leave like when my mind is idle it just goes there um, so yeah it's probably more an obsession than a passion <laughs> What's coming in the near future for your art? Is the next year or so have anything anything unexpected coming? I don't think unexpected. I'm probably just like I found my home. Like I don't see why I sh it's like a lot of collaboration has enabled me to to do different things like the one I just did with the crypto cubes like it became more of a study of movement and soft bodies in space rather than um, cloths in, in architectural settings. Um, but I, 
I honestly just love creating beautiful spaces and throwing pieces of cloth into them. So I don't think much will change there. I want to do more collabs um, and interpret other concepts. But the thing is, um, me working as a lead 3D at a studio enables me to do a lot of different things in my daily work life. Um, so I I explore a lot there, uh, and I'm encouraged to explore there by my bosses. Um, so I, I don't feel like my art is my meditation. My art is my home. My art is my space. It's, it's where I'm truly comfortable. So as boring as it might seem, not much is going to change. Having found your creative home, your your no creative abode, if you will, um, oh and and kind of and kind of t gone gone through a lot to get to this point. Is there anything that you might say to your twenty year old self about creativity or or making a a life in art and finding your home in art that that you might have said? that could have helped you a little get there a little faster that's a deeply philosophical philosoph uh, philosophical what's the word philosophical Phil philosophical philosophical sorry that's the, <laughs> that's the thing <laughs> um it's it's also late in denmark right now yes we're, we're close to 10 now if not 10. anyways um I, I have a strong belief that I am the person I am because of the things that happened to me, so I would not tamper. Sometimes it just takes time to get to who you are and where you are. And you know what? When I'm 50, I might be someone completely different. Um, so no, I would probably just watch my idiot 20 year old self and laugh a bit and then go <laughs> be on my way <laughs> that's a great answer so christian this has been an absolute pleasure getting the chance to talk to you and have have all of my questions answered i still have more but we need to wrap this up at some point um... <laughs> we can do a part two yeah uh, absolutely. Um, in the meantime, where can our listeners learn more about you, follow what you're doing? Um, yeah. Well, mainly Twitter. That's that's my main platform. Um, DMs are open. If you want to talk to me, I answer everyone, even the scammers. Um, not in a nice way, but I do answer them. Um, so, so... No creative underscore ETH because some guy still has my no creative tag and he's not posted since 2014. <laughs> well, you got to wait until until Elon does I, the, the handle purge. I, the check, account I, purge. Check, I check daily now because <laughs> I need that. Well, no creative underscore ETH. DMs are open and um, almost um, like I post every day to be honest. And I have done the last two and a half years. That would be the place. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on. And I'm looking forward to see you have a, a drop, I think, next week, right? Wednesday. With, with Maker's Place. Uh -huh. And then uh, and then we'll see you in Lisbon. I won't be there, but um, the you're going to be there with and this exhibit uh is going to be live the ai art exhibit all yep. kinds of exciting things yeah you got some good people from bloom there and uh it's, it's gonna be a great week awesome well thank you so much and um and i'll talk to you soon thank you for having me it was a pleasure